Norman Solomon is an American journalist, media critic, activist, and author of a dozen books. The New Press has just published his latest, War Made Invisible, How America Hides the Human Toll of Its Military Machine. A documentary of his book, War Made Easy, How Presidents and Pundits Keep Spinning Us to Death, was narrated by Sean Penn. Solomon is the author and executive director of the Institute for Public Accuracy and co-founder and national director of RootsAction.org, which has over one million supporters. He wrote the nationally syndicated Media Beat weekly column from 1992 to 2009 and is a longtime associate of the media watch group FAIR, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting. Solomon has won both the George Orwell Award for Distinguished Contribution to Honesty and Clarity in Public Language and the Ruben Salazar Journalism Award. He has appeared as a guest on many media outlets, including the PBS NewsHour, CNN, MSNBC, Fox News Channel, Al Jazeera, BBC Radio, Democracy Now!, and nationally heard public radio programs. His written columns has, have appeared in the Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, New York Times, Boston Globe, Miami Herald, USA Today, Philadelphia Inquirer, Baltimore Sun, The Hill, The International Herald Tribune, Canada's Globe and Mail, and The Toronto Star. Other books Solomon authored or co-authored include Unreliable Sources, A Guide to Detecting Bias in News Media, published in 1990. Through the Media Looking Glass in 1995, Made Love, Got War, Target Iraq, and Wizards of Media Oz, Behind the Curtain of Mainstream News. The reality that organizing in the long term is what makes our country better and prevents the country from being even worse than it is. And so it's Peace and Justice Works uh, with its Iraq Affinity Group that is part and parcel of really what we have to be proud of in this country. When you think of all of the progress that has been made in the last decades, hundreds of years, everything we have to be proud of is because people organized from the bottom up. Uh, power, as Frederick Douglass said, never concedes without a struggle. It never did and it never will. And when we think about the Iraq war and other aspects of U.S. military intervention in our lifetimes, truly the mass media fades in and out and the political focus out of Capitol Hill and so forth, the punditocracy also fade in and out. Sometimes there's a lot of discussion about U.S. military interventions, sometimes virtually none in the mass media. But the intervention continues nonetheless in various forms. And the latest forms are not so visible. The cliche boots on the ground uh, does not really apply so much. Uh, President Biden almost two years ago went to the United Nations and proclaimed that the United States is no longer at war. He said that the U.S. has turned the page. Interesting, if true, but not. The reality is that according to the Costs of War Project at Brown University, the United States is still involved in military activities, the so-called war on terror, in various forms in about 80 countries. And part of what's happened is that in comparison to, say, the previous decade and the first decade of this century, a lot more reliance proportionally is on air power, the drones, the gravity bombs, the missiles special operations, what really doesn't make the news even in a tangential way. And so we're in a different era and yet a lot of continuity with what that radical Dwight Eisenhower in his farewell address as president called uh, the military industrial complex that could now be called the military industrial media intelligence complex. And one of the things that I show in my new book, Or Made Invisible, is that even though the styles of U.S. military intervention have changed and we don't see, quote unquote, the wars in our mass media as much as we had in previous years, those wars in different forms are going on. 
And that includes, you might say, the wars at home. And Martin Luther King Jr. described during the Vietnam War what he called a, quote, demonic suction tube. And whether you're walking around Portland, Oregon, or New York City, or any other city or town in the United States, you're going to see not only the presence of deterioration, but the absence, if you are really looking at the conditions that people live under, the shortage, the absence of adequate health care, education, housing, neonatal care, elderly care. I could go on and on. And that's what Dr. King was talking about, the demonic suction tube that he described in 1967 is with us in 2023. And the fact that rarely do mass media outlets talk about that or open up the subject doesn't change the imperative for us to address it, to educate, to agitate, and to organize. As a matter of fact, the abdication of responsibility from mainstream media outlets really makes it all the more imperative that we engaged in alternative independent media, engaged in activism at grassroots levels, that we redouble our efforts. We don't get a lot of support. There's not a lot of money for challenging the warfare state. It's just an astronomical disconnect and disconnection between the huge amounts of money poured into not only the Pentagon, more than $850 billion with a B every year now, but also the amount of money that's poured into messaging for the Pentagon overtly and subtly. The fact that the Pentagon cooperates with what there is in Hollywood now, for instance, okay, you can use our aircraft carrier for free. You can do your next top gun and we will allow you to use our equipment, but we want script approval. We're not going to loan out our uh, equipment uh, unless we like what you're doing. Another form, and I think this has been true in Portland, it's been true around the United States, the Pentagon has brought militarism home more than ever with something called the 1033 program, which is basically that tanks and MRAPs and different weapon systems on a small scale, and they're not missiles, but the ones that can be used in the streets of the United States They are given to police forces around the country by the Pentagon. And the Pentagon says, if you don't use them, we will take them back. That's another way in which the warfare state becomes almost invisible because we get used to it. And what is outrageous one year becomes more normalized the next. So in any event, I'm looking forward to questions that you have, Lisa, and discussion we can have and and to really address this multifactorial problem we have of militarism in the United States and the tremendous effects it has, uh, very overt, but also sometimes quite subtle, even while very powerful. Well, the amnesia, the United States of amnesia, it's been called, is many factors. A lot of it is what is repeated. Let me give you one example. The Memories that are recapped and shared when we have Martin Luther King Day, when we have uh, the anniversary of his assassination, we have quite often, at least in snippets, a replay of his I Have a Dream speech in 1963, a beautiful speech about human rights against racism and for racial equality. Well, he also gave a speech which was quite historic as well, at Riverside Church on April 4th, 1967, the Beyond Vietnam speech, where he denounced militarism in this society in a profound way, not just about the Vietnam War, but in ongoing um, multifaceted respects, eloquent, powerful speech. It's just not aired. You're not going to hear it on national public radio, not even for 10 seconds. You're not going to see it in the retrospectives on the evening news. It just went down the memory hole. And that's an example, but also a metaphor for how what we're not reminded of, what isn't repeated and recalled and shared, it's not only those of us who lived through it, but what about the next generation and the generation after that? So 
it's a very selective kind of history. It was in 1984 that Orwell wrote, as I remember, those who control the past control the future. Those who control the present control the past. And that's where activism and media are so important and so intertwined. And I just really encourage people to see information flow and media at the same time as activism as vital together. We don't hop along if we're fortunate. If we have two legs, we we use both of them. And the information flow is absolutely crucial. And the activism is absolutely crucial. And just one won't do it. We desperately and emphatically need both. This new book, War Made Invisible, is the first one I've written in at least 15 years. And I'd really plunged into activism. I'd always, I've always been an activist, but I did write 12 books before this one. And I just got really drawn into working with others uh, locally, regionally, nationally, sometimes uh, beyond the U.S. borders. And Uh, felt and still feel that activism is crucial. And by the way, it's the most difficult activity I've ever experienced. To be an activist at the grassroots means that we are constantly running uphill. We don't have the social support that so many enterprises have. There are messages of omission and commission from mass media that are quite discouraging to involve many people. And Often it's a matter of sporadic media attention that will draw people for a while and then it will dissipate. But I think of that as kind of a like a train, that if a train has stopped, then when there's an obvious need for it, it's very difficult and very slow to get it rolling. Whereas at least if we have it going all the time, which is to say activism 24-7, 365, then it has a quality of keeping things going to the extent that people's thoughts and infrastructure to the degree there is can be maintained. And so we're not at a dead stop when some overt crisis takes place. So for me, activism inside and outside the Democratic Party was important. In 2016 and 2020, I was a Bernie Sanders delegate to the National Convention. I've worked at rootsaction.org since we were founded 11 years ago, an online activist group. I hope people will, if you're not getting our action alerts, go to rootsaction.org and and please sign up. And eventually, though, I came to feel that I had experienced a lot about this warfare state and its evolution. Tremendous continuity, but also differences, as we've uh, been talking about in the last few minutes. More reliance on air power, fewer U.S. troops overtly engaged in war. And yet the militarization of society, if anything, has been magnified. And the wallpaper is absorbing militarism. The media echo chamber normalizes it. And so that's really the genesis of the War Made Invisible book. And I did, yes, want to write a book that makes an anti-war case. I also wanted to try to capture what I think is almost ineffable, and it's hidden in plain sight. It's right in front of us that the militarism in the U.S. is so pervasive, so powerful, and has been so normalized that essentially the people on this planet in the U.S. psyche, individually, socially, and in media, Humanity has been divided into two different categories, the people who matter and the people who don't, what I call in the book, two tiers of grief. And you can test it out very clearly when you look at the media coverage of U.S. wars in, for instance, Iraq and Afghanistan, the coverage of the people at the other end of U.S. missiles and bombs and drone strikes they rarely got any empathetic coverage whatsoever. They rarely got coverage at all. And when they were covered, it was sporadic. It was presented as a a rare occasional occurrence, even though we know from the Cost of War Project at Brown that more than 300,000 civilians were directly killed in the U.S. so-called war on terror in the last 20 years. 
So those people have become tacitly non-persons, unpersons. And then there are the U.S. soldiers, and they have been in the media to the extent they were covered, empathetically portrayed, as they should be, arguably. And so the troops who came home with physical and emotional injury, PTSD, there's been some coverage, not adequate, not tracing it to militarism, but still there has been some pattern of coverage of what happens to U.S. soldiers and their loved ones, the deaths, the injuries, the mourning uh, before the media spotlight goes away, some attention. Now we're seeing the U.S. coverage of people in Ukraine. If you set aside the political spin and just look at the kind of coverage that those people in Ukraine have uh, been the subject of, they're suffering under the bombs, the, the vicious Russian attack and ongoing war on Ukrainian people. Tremendous empathetic coverage, whether you're reading the Oregonian or the New York Times or NBC News or NPR News and a whole host of the U.S. media outlets, they, they are all treated as human beings. They're in the other tier of grief. They're sort of almost honorary Americans. They are being killed by an official U.S. enemy. Well, maintaining two tiers of grief and overlaying those two tiers on all of humanity on this planet, that's very damaging to our humanity, whether you want to call it ethically, morally, spiritually, whatever description you want to attach to it. There's something fundamentally corrosive and destructive about the if you will, moral fiber of the United States as a country, as a media realm, as a political arena, and as individuals. So that core assessment is really at the center of the War Made Invisible book. So much of the media coverage of foreign policy in the mass media of this country is through a window that's tinted red, white, and blue. So sooner or later, usually sooner, it gets back to, it's about us. And when it's about us, even though the United States has within its borders about 4% of the world's population, then that emphasis, that combination of nationalism and jingoism and so forth, which is really antithetical to authentic journalism that's supposed to function without fear or favor, then the tilt is very extreme. And a message that's overt or maybe more subtle is that it's the vantage point of the United States and even more specifically of those who are top government officials who presume to say what is in the interest of the United States, which is often in the interests of Wall Street and so forth. That whole capacity to define what matters and what doesn't is extremely powerful. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, there was a lot of triumphalism and rejoicing and discussion of how the world had become unipolar, which was to say, hey, the United States uh, runs the world or at least is so dominant. And I think of a bumper sticker that used to be very popular among some uh, pro-war folks, and they would put on their vehicle a red, white, and blue sticker, and it would say, these colors don't run. And it was an affirmation of the idea that you know, the United States as the most powerful military can and should do what it wants and is capable of triumphing as a result of its military strength. The counter bumper sticker to that was red, white, and blue. And it said, these colors don't run the world. Those are two fundamental differences. And so to get back to this rejoicing, this triumphalism about whether the United States had become the unipolar power, that was actually the case for a while. But of course, the economic power of the United States, despite all the rhetoric about being the indispensable nation, 
the U.S. less and less runs the world, but has the strongest military. And something I would say to people on the left is that we should be wary of the idea that this planet has a unilateral or a, a unipolar source of evil. Yes, the United States has killed far more people on this planet in this century than any other government in the world. You know, you look at the direct and indirect consequences of loss of lives from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere, and there's, there's no contest. The U.S. has slaughtered more people, uh, not only directly, but as I say, indirectly. The Cost of War Project at Brown University says for each one of the civilians who directly died in the U.S. so-called war on terror, several others have died indirectly, destruction of health care, water resources, infrastructure, and so forth. But as much as that's true, we have a reality that the Russian government has more and more become aggressive and, uh, if you will, imperialistic, at least in terms of Ukraine. And so we know all the arguments, and I have them in uh, were made invisible that the U.S. has expanded NATO uh, in contradiction to its promise after the Berlin Wall fell, and that the U.S. in many ways set the stage uh, for this conflict in Ukraine, at the same time that the invasion by uh, the Russian government is, is a war crime. And part of the problem, I think, that we could point up in terms of U.S. mass media is not that they are labeling Vladimir Putin as a war criminal, but that the same media outlets would never dream of labeling, for instance, George W. Bush as a war criminal. And yet the magnitude of the crimes, if you're going to look at the numbers, I mean, certainly if anybody qualifies in this century uh, for such a title, it is George W. Bush. We could have a discourse about what does it mean that President Barack Obama escalated the war in Afghanistan soon after becoming president without any legitimacy. We're hearing now from, you know, umpteen pundits and from so many people on Capitol Hill and people such as President Biden and Antony Blinken, the Secretary of State, about how it is absolutely unacceptable and a terrible crime to invade another country. That, and this is said with a straight face. You know, Blinken says it, Biden says it. We need an international order. We have to have international law that's adhered to. And what the Russian government is doing in Ukraine is absolutely contrary to human decency. And it's a measure of U.S. media and the dominance of the military mentality that it's almost impossible to find in corporate mass media any mention of the contradiction that Blinken as the chief of staff of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee when Biden held sham hearings in 2002 to help pave the way for the invasion of Iraq, these people were important to make the invasion of Iraq politically possible. So that's where I think we get into a double think uh, situation, and we are in one, where in the novel 1984, George Orwell describes doublethink as you take a fact when it's convenient for you and you take it off the shelf. And then what's not convenient for you anymore, you put it back on the shelf as though it doesn't exist. That's where we are on Capitol Hill in terms of foreign policy. And that's where we are in U.S. mass media. Both the political culture, such as it is on Capitol Hill and in the White House and so forth, and the mass media, the sort of stenographic mentality from corporate media outlets, really, it all lends itself to saying that when America kills people overseas, including civilians, oh, sorry, that's unfortunate. We didn't mean to do it. Not a big deal. That's what it all boils down to. I mean, a, a clear example uh, most recently in terms of a very particularly horrific weapon is that when Russia invaded Ukraine about almost a year and a half ago now, 
there was a lot of publicity front page in the New York Times and elsewhere that the Russian forces used cluster munitions, which are horrific. They explode these what are called bomblets horizontally. Uh, they uh, shred human bodies, notorious for killing civilians indiscriminately. And quite properly, the New York Times described how horrific that uh, was without, as I document in the book, mentioning that the United States uh, exploded 1.8 to 2 million cluster munition bomblets during the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Great example of double think, just not bringing it up. What's my radical source? The Congressional Research Service in one of the uh, many endnotes in the book. That's an example where when the U.S. shredded the bodies of human beings with these horrible weapons, barely any mention at all. And yet when the designated enemy does it, there's a lot of political and propaganda hay made out of it. It's a tough question you've asked, Lisa, because there are so many different layers of it. It's social, it's media, it's interpersonal. It has so many aspects of nationalism. I quote in the book, War Made Invisible, a short story that was written by William Dean Howells more than 100 years ago. And by the way, he was uh, good friends with Mark Twain. And the short story was called Aditha. And this is right after the U.S. has invaded and slaughtered so many into the hundreds of thousands of people in the Philippines uh, around the turn of the century, the very end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th. And the character in the short story says, what a wonderful thing it is to be in a country that can't be wrong, but when it is, is right anyway. 